Um, welcome all to this uh, Team Society webinar. My name is Sarah Heidenreich and I'm a researcher at the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies of Cultures at NTNU and I'm supporting the coordination of the Team Society. Um, for those of you who are new here today, just very briefly, what is Team Society? We are a team of uh, social science and humanities researchers organized under NTNU Energy. We do basically two things. We have some research projects we do. And the other thing we do is to try to showcase and promote the diversity of social science and humanities research on energy and sustainability issues across NTNU. Um, today's presentation is about uh, a green maritime shift, lessons from the electrification of ferries in Norway. And I'm very happy to have Simon Rosta Serter as presenter today and Markus Steen as discussant. So I would like to give the word to Simon. There. Okay. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Is everything good? Yeah. Okay. So today I will present a paper that is co authored uh, with Professor Espen Moore at the Department of Sociology and Political Science at NTNU, together with me, Simon Rosetto. I'm a PhD student in political science. Uh, so this paper that Sarah tol uh, told you about, it's called the Green Maritime Shift, Lesson from the Electrification of Norwegian Ferries. Uh, we have recently submitted this paper to Energy uh, Research and Social Science uh, and is currently under review. And it's one of the first attempts at studying the politically accelerated transition in the maritime sector. Uh, quickly, we have uh, used, uh, we have gathered data through interviews and also focus groups and also attended uh, high profile uh, workshops and conferences. Uh, additionally, we have looked at uh, official documents, white papers, strategies, uh, and, and so on, and media statements. So we have a good sort of cross-referencing uh, material, which we have used as the case material. So a little bit of the theoretical backdrop. So uh, Mu states that uh, energy transitions are, can be defined as long-term uh, fundamental uh, structural changes in the energy system. And uh, energy transition scholar, uh, Vatka Slim, uh, he asserts that what they all have in common is that they have uh, their long duration. Uh, the literature on these uh, sort of political dynamics uh, of the energy transition also suggests that these transitions are difficult and they're protracted. Uh, they're messy, conflictual, and highly disjointed. So, um, so we sort of base our theoretical backdrop on four different sort of uh, theoretical Backlash, and the, the one is the first one is uh, national systems of innovation, uh, and I just move this there. Uh, so that's sort of the networks and institutions uh, where. So I just have to fix my backup here. Uh, is the networks and institutions of the private and public sectors that sort of where they interact and where they initiate, import, and also diffuse to new technologies. So, uh, so what it tells us is that we can expect that structural change uh, is more easily pursued in systems of innovations, uh, which uh, are characterized by networking, uh, cooperation and openness. Um, uh, and also where sort of, sort of the overarching principle is sort of knowledge sharing and collaboration over cutthroat competition. And secondly, we have sort of this Masakaru light version uh, where we, she sort of emphasizes that we have to go beyond a uh, system of innovations. She emphasizes the role of the state and a central point being that sort of this state as merely a facilitator belongs to the past. Uh, instead, 
she, she suggests that uh, the state is a key partner with, uh, with, uh, with the private sector and it sort of coordinates intra-industrial uh, exchange uh, and uh, sort of intra-company and uh, private public space. Uh, and it sort of, it uses public procurement, for instance, and sort of uh, takes risk more than sort of the private sector can do. And also it sort of shapes and creates new markets. And uh, that's very important. So the third one is we, we back around on this sort of energy transitions, they do create winners and losers. And the losers are typically all the incumbents. Uh, and the uh, characteristic of that is that they had ample time to, to organize and to influence and uh, lobby politicians. So the transition literature actually says or tells us that, that uh, transitions routinely meet uh, vested interest resistance. And finally, uh, Alkin and Ibrahim, they theorize that the current carbon lock-in is so prevalent that uh, no change can happen unless there is some shock that sort of repoliticizes the field. And then finally, on sort of the more political science and, and sort of this political uh, side of things, uh, so Stocks and Breeds, they highlight that uh, while many studies look at uh, technical and the economic and the policy drivers, very little attention has actually been looked on sort of these political dynamics of the energy transition. And finally, uh, even though sort of the, the current renewable transition is, is actively pursued by policymakers, the crucial issue of the politics surrounding their deliberate acceleration remains understudied. And this is sort of what we, we have as a backdrop here. So I will go through some of, let's see. Some of the key developments that has led to this sort of this electrification, the, the, the accelerated transition. And as you may know, uh, Norway has the first electric uh, ferry and it's called the MF Ampere. And it has its, had its maiden voyage in uh, May of 2015. And it was a result of a competition that was posted by the Ministry of Transport in 2011. So quite a long time ago. And then it resulted in this uh, developmental contract with Staten uh, the Norwegian Public Road Administration. And then a little bit simultaneously as this uh, sort of uh, maiden voyage and sort of the success of, of, um, of uh, the Ampere Ferry, uh, you had the, the oil price crash uh, in, in, uh, in 2014 and, uh, and beyond which led to a lot of sort of considerable debate and sort of a lot of the lobbying went into how do we sort of save and how do we, how do we save the, the, the maritime sector basically. And, uh, you know, not to long story short, it ended up in, 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 in support for this, uh, this uh, parliamentary ruling, which, which states that, that uh, all new ferry tenders in Norway has to be uh, low, emission technologies, if it's possible. And this sort of set the stage a bit and also with together uh, with, with the success and the sort of this proof of concept that the MF Ampere gave us. So very quickly about the Norwegian ferry sector, we, in 2017, we had about 200 ferries with a very old uh, fleet accounting for about 13% of total emissions from, uh, from shipping and about 2.4% uh, of total CO2 emissions from Norway, as well as being a, a very considerable source of, of, of local pollutions at ports. Uh, as of early 2021, we have 34 lanes, which uh, are fully electric or hybrid electric with a considerable electrification rate. And we also now have one hydrogen ferry I'm not sure if it's fully operational yet, but I think they're testing it right now. And then there is scheduled uh, 57 uh, lanes. And as you can see from the map, we sort of, we tried to, to map this out. And uh, of course, uh, 
you can note in Nolan there is uh, in 2024 there is one hydrogen that's the, the longest uh, it's the one that goes to from Buddha to Lofoten which will be hydrogen so that's cool uh, and the final here is that uh, they were supposed like the governmental goal sort of the platform they had from last election said that they would have they would like to or they would try to provide the low and zero emission solutions to all ferries between 2025 but this like last year last well, late last year they changed this or they pushed it upward to 2023 so we would probably expect that some of these uh, rest of these lanes will also be pushed to towards electrification so we propose four main exploratory factors that has led to a rapid elect electrification of Norwegian ferries. So the first is what we label uh, the Norwegian ferry innovation system. The second is the Norwegian entrepreneurial state. And thirdly, we find uh, an absence of vested interests. And fourth, the oil price shock is an accelerator. So I'll go into more detail about those. So. The first one is, like I said, what we labeled, uh, what we label the very innovation system. And we assert that it has played a major role in creating the conditions and the environment where electrification could happen. Uh, and it frankly is because, you know, there is a lot of dialogue between of these things and, and they, they together, they have sort of facilitated, they have, engaged in dialogue, they have figured out what is needed and they have worked and they have like this good uh, collaboration between them uh, and state and both the private sector and the public sector. And uh, it's also mobilized the supply chain uh, because of this openness and uh, sort of moving towards the same goal and also uh, overlapping and finding sort of the right solutions. Uh, so that is one very key uh, condition that we we find. The second is uh, what we then call the Norwegian entrepreneurial state, and we assert that that uh, we find that uh, the Norwegian state acted entrepreneurially, moving beyond merely being a de-risker and actually played a very active and crucial role as market creator and uh, transformer through various agencies such as uh, the Norwegian Public Road Administration and through the counties and also all of the support schemes which have uh, have assisted and sort of worked together uh, mobilizing. And then we also find that uh, we show that the market mechanisms alone would never have yielded as fast a transition uh, simply because it, it would have taken much longer because there weren't any electrification or uh, uh, options on the table. So, so, and we also find that the state sort of involved itself by taking several boxes. So what I alluded to earlier, they, they focus on sort of this overarching uh, uh, sort of uh, strategy of, of creating sort of uh, uh, battery and also uh, the greening of the maritime sector, the Norwegian maritime sector, which is huge. So they sort of benefited both the climate and potentially also creating global uh, growth clusters and industry. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, we find that the absence of vested interests uh, resistance in the maritimes have made it easier to pursue politics of structural change and find win-win solutions. Uh, in fact, to the extent that uh, the vested interests played a role, they actually actively pursued push the state to provide them conditions and incentivize electrification and low emission technology, which is historically uh, quite a, quite a opposite of what has happened before. So instead of fear of losing out uh, because of electrification, the sector actually saw it perhaps as an inevitable change and tried to position themselves to benefit from it. And finally, uh, so the relative absence of, of uh, of vested interests interplayed with the occurrence of this strong oil shock in 20, sort of uh, 20, 20, 20, 14, 15, and 16, uh, which created a further incentive to for a maritime sector that was deeply, deeply dependent on, on orders from the petroleum sector to find new markets and products. And in many ways, uh, ferries became one of the new sort of lifelines for the industry. So, 
that's um, I will just have to get my notes here. So what we have done in the paper is that we have made six success criteria for the transition. And I will try to sort of briefly go through them. And the first one that we uh, was highlighted extensively throughout this, uh, this, uh, this uh, process is that the extensive dialogue between the actors in the, uh, in the innovation system has been hailed as a, both a success and also it's a, one of the most important things that this dialogue between the actors is extremely important. Secondly, we have an innovation system in Norway that is characterized by close collaboration and that of an absence of opposing vested interests. And uh, sort of uh, the stakeholders in the ferry segment and by extension, the maritime sector in Norway uh, is fairly small uh, and manageable. And they're also part of large clusters. And uh, we have uh, sort of one line that has been sort of repeated in different sort of <laughs> ways is that the Norwegian actors or the actors in the maritime sector, they uh, collaborate when they can and they compete only when they have to. And uh, this sort of both uh, creates this unique environment where, where you're sort of pulling in the same directions and you're inventing and you're refining your, your, your system and you want to succeed and you succeed together. And uh, sort of this focus on developing those um, competitive uh, national supply chains uh, probably created some of these sort of would be transition losers into what we could call convertibles or maybe even winners in a transition. So that has been very important. And uh, we think that that is a success criteria. And then thirdly, uh, an interconnected system and an active state. So, so the, the range of, of uh, supply, sorry, the um, support schemes and the process knowledge that a lot of these, uh, these programs have, have uh, facilitated a lot of this sharing between actors in the system and that has helped tr tremendously. And they also have um, created uh, sort of uh, strong uh, incentives to collaborate. And it's also true that Enova has uh, sort of had this, like I told a little bit about earlier, they had this uh, focus on transform market transformation goals, which sort of led into this uh, focus on, on supply chains, uh, which is, has been very important. And it's sort of connected into this national competitive advantage that Norway has with the renewable energy and the, and the process knowledge we have for 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 manufacture and and uh, both in the both in the in the mineral space so you know like the battery technologies and, and so on and uh, they actually we know we have two battery factories already in Norway which uh, focus on the maritime industry uh, Corvus in Bergen and, and Siemens here in, in Trondheim so these uh, are at least partly a result of our, of our focus to, 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 to be front runners here. So fourthly, the Norwegian entrepreneurial states. So they sort of pulled together in the same direction, uh, which made it possible to for for local and regional uh, policymakers to, to to be more ambitious, and uh, because you had that sort of overlay in the, in the in the in the in the system, and um, sort of this de-risking uh, factor of, of the national road public road administration really did help to to to, to focus sort of on a lot of the upfront cost and also the focus on getting the what we could call sort of this transition enabling uh, infrastructure uh, which you know charging for these uh, ferries uh, that is didn't happen by itself and 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 the norwegian uh, sort of uh, public sector has been very crucial in, in enabling that which then led to you know this uh, this focus on on procurement and uh, ambitious climate targets really did set the direction for the ferry sector and then finally, 
we uh, making a best out of a crisis. So uh, the stakeholder really did use this uh, window of oppor opportunity uh, that the old oil price uh, price crash uh, created uh, to sort of position both the, the support system and also the, the industries to be more competitive in a new environment, which which uh, we, we are seeing now is yearning for sort of this low emission, low zero emission uh, technologies. So uh, it is uh, very uh, key to, to, to getting that over the line. So we do have some conclusions. So of course, I think it's pretty obvious to everyone that a lot of our findings are undoubtedly uh, case specific to Norway. And there are of course good reasons why Norway would be uh, expected to be a front runner in exactly this area. Uh, we have a strong tradition in the maritime sector and uh, it's really something that, that made sense for that. So beside having a well-functioning innovation system and a state that actively facilitated structural change, uh, one of the lessons is, like I alluded to earlier, is that to, to find sort of these national competitive advantages in the energy industry is increasingly important. As policymaker and public support system allocate scarcer resources in their attempt to identify sustainable growth impulses. Uh, we thus believe that this uh, case holds some important lessons uh, in terms of the interaction between the public and the private sector, and ultimately in terms of how transition, even in hard to decarbonize sector as the maritime sector is, can be politically accelerated. So linking sort of the green maritime shift to national uh, chains of suppliers and battery producers has in this case aligned uh, climate and industrial policy goals. This has indeed accelerated the process of change and uh, other countries and regions might have different competitive industries, sectors and niches that are conducive to an energy transition. And this case shows how Norway did it with its ferries. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for this really great uh, presentation of what so far sounds like a quite successful story. <laughs> Let's see how we think after the discussion. Um, I would now like to give the word to our discussant, Markus Steen, before then opening for a more general discussion afterwards. All right, thanks, um, Sarah, and uh, thanks, Simon, for a very interesting presentation. And I also had the chance to read the paper, so so uh, my comments are, are based on that also and um, um, to provide just a little bit of context so I'm, I'm working in CINTEF and for the last five six years a lot of my research time has been devoted to to studying this uh, transition or transition process in the in the shipping sector um, especially coastal shipping in Norway and also the port sector so we've been doing that in the in the green fleet project and in the a project called Terracepo and also working on, on on sort of maritime sector transitions in um, FME entrance and, uh, and and also other projects. So I think I just wanted to say this beforehand because I'm, I'm quite familiar with the case um, and I also work a lot with <clears throat> with transition theory. Um, so um, I guess if if I didn't have this kind of background uh, knowledge, um, my my comments I think would be quite different. So while I agree this is an, a, a success story, it's a very interesting case of how of how policy um, can play a role in transitions. Um, I have to say that I there are things here that I'm quite critical to. Um, in terms of how you, um, how you, in terms of both your framework and how you and your findings actually, so um, so take it as that. So this is coming from a, a critical friend. So I'm, my comments are, I'm acting the reviewer now in in um, in energy research and social science, and so um, to begin in mind, I have quite a lot of notes and they're a bit sort of all over the place, and I added more when you spoke. 
now. So, but I'll try to try to bring some coherence into this. So, just to begin with, I think um, there is a need for a much more thorough literature review. So you make the statement that there is a lack of research on, on the maritime sector, there is a lack of research on the politics of transitions. So I can mention at least, I think, eight or 10 relevant papers and reports dealing with directly or indirectly with this case and about electrification of maritime shipping in Norway. So some of that is coming from um, the work that we did in the Greenfleet project. Um, but there's also other work. Um, so my colleague here at Sintef, Christianus Matbjerkan, um, and colleagues uh, in FME Moses wrote about the procurement contracts and the role of that for these changes that we're seeing in ferries. There's also this, I think, quite important paper for, for, for you, which is Sven Gunnar Schöten's paper on Ampar as a pilot and demonstration project, uh, which Ampar had really nothing to do with pilot E, which I think you write in the paper. So those are separate things. But anyways, I think that Schurten paper is quite important. Um, there's also work by, by also by, um, which Sven Gunnar Schurten also was involved in with Rudin Jörs um, and others at, um, at um, Högskuren på Vestlande, which is a different name now, sorry, I can't remember. Uh, but uh, anyways, they have a paper published last year that looked into the, the sort of the cluster in the western part of Norway around around um, uh, the maritime sector also, which I think is relevant. So there's that sort of the transition work on, and there's obviously more, so let's say social science um, work on sustainability transitions within ship. Thing. There's not a lot, but there is some, and I think you need to look into that. Um, and then second, I think this is really about the politics of transitions. And I think I was there were things there I was kind of expecting. So, um, for instance, uh, the work by, by Meadowcraft, there are a few references, but there are more recent references, I think, that are important. I also think that there's lots of work now on, on uh, the Energiewende as an example of politics and accelerating transitions, obviously on a much bigger scale in a sense, but there is more there and I think you need to showcase that. I think also you should look at the work by um, Håkon Nurman uh, on, the, on the politics of transitions and on policy networks. And this, I think, has quite a bit to do with, I think, I think your paper would benefit from being more focused on the politics. So I'm also a bit kind of, I'm coming from, I'm an economic geographer as a background and working in also a lot with sort of innovation studies, which is sort of integral or a, a part of sustainability transitions or, well, that you could frame that in different ways. But, but anyway, so the, the innovation system literature, I'm not really sure how very useful it is here. Um, sort of, and I, I'm, I would, I, I, not sure I would agree that you can call something a ferry innovation system, or you can, you can set that kind of boundary. But I think that one of the key things here is that this is, you need, there's this maritime sort of national level innovation system. Lots of people have also written about that, but, um, and I think it's because I think it's, getting also then to what the sort of the incumbents and what the different actors here are. They aren't, there are very few, um, let's say, actors on the whole supply side of the maritime sector. So one thing is the shipping company. So the ferry operators, they have the ferries and that's sort of it. Mostly, some of them have other stuff also. But if you look at the supply side, most of the shipyards and all the technology developers and suppliers and so on, they, they, they sell not only to the ferry sector, but to many different market segments within shipping, right? So, so obviously there's an interest there in, in something novel occurring, right? Um, in the, in, so there's something about this kind of, what were the really the preconditions that enabled also policy to play this kind of role? There's that window of opportunity opening up. And there's something there, which I also find a little bit lacking in the paper. So, so and, and it's about really understanding the, the climate policy goals and how those are at the national level and how they're being taken up by Staten Zeewassen or the Norwegian Public Roads Administration that you refer to in the paper, how they also trickle down to the regional level. So, so you find regions like Vestland and, and some of that have been sort of very proactive here. They set very high emission reduction goals, right? And, and how can a county, so if you look at what these counties, 
you know, what are their emissions? What are they responsible for? And what can they do about it? The sort of ferries and especially fast ferries, they represent a huge chunk of that. So it's kind of, this is where we need to act as, a, as it, you know, from the policymaker side of the table, if we are to meet our climate goals. So there's that really, I think that's important and it's really, it's, it hasn't been spelled out as part of the, of your story. And I also think there's a kind of a, there's a, another part of this story, which is that over the last, I don't know, let's say five, five, ten years, or let's say last five years and coming five years, there's this period now where lots of ferries needed to re be replaced anyways, because they were old. So there's that window of opportunity there of building new and buying new or retrofitting existing ferries. So that, that also that window of opportunity was kind of supported by that. And then I think there's something about the way that you um, that you frame or tell the story about the sort of the industry and the cluster. And I I think I I wouldn't say that this is can be should be seen as a as a as a creative destruction in a sense. There's no big disruption, really, and for the suppliers not. And, and why is that? Well, it's because we're not talking about their entire market being changed overnight. So, and hybridization suggests that the internal combustion engine will will still be around for a long time, right? So, so there's something about this, most of all, being a welcome opportunity for you know, some of the globally leading maritime suppliers, right? Um, and some of them already have some experience with batteries and electrification because of research projects and pilot projects that came before Ampire. So this started earlier. Um, so I think it's kind of, um, and, I, and then there's that kind of the way that the framing of incumbents, this is, you know, people, opinions differ here, but I, I think that looking at the transition literature, a lot of the, especially the early work and the way that one discussed and talked about the role of incumbents was very much based on, I would say, a quite limited understanding of incumbents. So incumbents would, the typical incumbent would be the large power company, the large oil producer or whatever, right? And obviously they have strong vested interests and they want to, often want to, um, to uh, keep things stable. Um, but I think some of the sort of quite interesting incumbents looking at the maritime sector in Norway are some of the, are the big supplier companies like Siemens or Vatsila or AB, uh, ABB and Rolls-Royce and all of those. And, and they've been very sort of welcoming to all these changes because they, they can play this role and they can, they can provide and they can bring along expertise from other markets that they serve. So there's something there which, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, and I think, so I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but so there's the, kind of the story of how procurement is really interesting here and uh, how the NPRA, so it doesn't say us, used procurement. I think it's kind of, I remember I've actually interviewed, they're also part of our Greenfleet project. They've been sort of very, I was struck by how they talked about really seeing their role through these development contracts of doing many things. So obviously the, the main thing is that the ferry operates regularly and it's safe and all that. But they also sort of were very vocal on saying that, you know, we actually see this as an opportunity for us to contribute to innovation and to the developing development of the maritime sector. And there's a history there also because they used the same kind of thinking and the same kind of instruments were used for LNG. Well, when LNG was introduced 20 years ago now. So there's that kind of history there that maybe, I don't know if you need to include it, but it's kind of interesting to be, <clears throat> be aware of. Um, yeah, so I think I'm not going to um, go on forever, but if I were, so if I were the review or one of the reviewers, which I'm not, um, I would, I would probably recommend you to to focus more. And I think I'd, I'd suggest to focus more on on the politics here, and and sort of what enabled that kind of policy and that kind of political practice. Um, and I think that can be explained by some of the elements that you have in the story. 
so about the sort of innovative industry but there's there are some other elements there which is about this need for replacement and and crucially i think the climate policy goal setting at both national and regional level um, and how that results in um, these procurement practices and then there's one final point which is um which i didn't really find here and that is that there's um there, because you also talk about sort of um, the value chain and so on. And then I didn't really understand what you meant if you were talking about the value chain that delivers ships. Because I think at least what I've what we observed, you know, one of the major changes with electrification and one of the major challenges is that the value chain is is reconfigured. It's changed because shipping connects now with the power sector. And there's that need for charging and grid development and, and so on. Um, and, and that is a major challenge. Um, and it's a reason in some cases why electrification isn't something that all counties jump onto because they don't have that grid infrastructure in place and it would require a lot of investment to get that in place. Um, yeah, and so, yeah. I think maybe I'll end there. So um, I hope uh, I didn't this didn't come across as overly critical. So I, it's a fascinating story, I, I think, but I think you need to sharpen it a bit. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus, for some great comments. Simon, would you like to reply to some of it? I don't think we have the time to go into really everything, but. Um. First and foremost, uh, thank you for excellent review. <laughs> I can almost call it that. Um, it's very fascinating to hear. Uh, and I think that's uh, definitely, I would like you to send me what you have written so we can go through it a bit more with Espen as well. And I think, uh, I think it's definitely the case that we have it's sort of, you know, it's a, it's a limited uh, amount and we cut a lot. I think we had, I don't know, it's been maybe 16,000 words uh, when we when we finished our draft. <laughs> so it's already been cut a lot. And I think, uh, but uh, I mean, like you alluded to, I think that of, there, there is obviously uh, things written about this, but very little has been written from a social science perspective and, and sort of, but I suppose we also got a bit dragged towards the other side as well, which I think you, which is kind of your, a little bit of your point that we might have focused more on the, on the, on the political side and sort of, you know, like double down a bit on, on that side and leave the rest to sort of, uh, to, to that is, which is, has been done already. Uh, and I think, uh, again, I, I can't really go through everything you said now, but I think uh, it's duly noted, but I think also sort of the supply, ch uh, supply chain uh, question is also, uh, it's also something that came up a lot in our interviews is that sort of this, this uh, Norway has a very strong maritime presence and sort of this connection, as you, as you pointed out, this uh, together with, with the renewable energy sector we have in Norway and this combination between sort of system integrators like, uh, like, uh, like Siemens and how they have decided to place their battery factories here, which is at least that's what our, our respondents tell us that, that that might have not happened that they put them here if we didn't have a very aggressive uh, focus on 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 uh, putting batteries in in all types of ships but but i think that's that's a valid point that i think we we could highlight more and i think i sort of you know it's not like the shipyards survived because of the ferries but it was one of the legs that they and you know they got uh, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, lucrative for them at all. And some of them actually lost quite a lot of money, but it sort of also put them up to this sort of uh, low emission capacity or, or, you know, like that sort of in-house knowledge and which we, you know, that's a little bit of the problem now is that we're losing that overseas now. And that is, again, this new round, you know, with Corona now and, and the pandemic, you know, we're, we're losing it to Turkish shipyards and we have done so for, for a while. And you see now this sort of kind of like the same uh, 
uh, political coalition almost sort of saying that, you know, we spent all this money on getting sort of, you know, building that capacity and now we're losing it overseas and we have to sort of make sure that ships are built in Norway because allegedly, you know, that, that without a home market, uh, it's going to be difficult to also develop. So, so, but uh, yeah, that's sort of like a little bit, but uh, I would very much like you to send send us the, the your comments, and uh, I think there will be definitely be one more round or maybe two even, you know, with this uh, with this paper. Uh, I'm also finishing my PhD, so it's good to have sent, uh, you know, to have one under the belt. So I think it's. Uh, but uh, I thank you for. I would love to talk more with you <laughs> about this stuff. I think it's uh, it's good to have someone that uh, also knows. So yeah, thanks. Thank you.